Today we're joined by two inspirational storytellers from Oracle Team USA, Julian Guthrie, um, she's the author of The Billionaire and the Mechanic, and we're also joined by um, Joseph um, Ozan, um, who is an engineer with Oracle Team USA. Please join me in welcoming them to Google. Thank you very much. So my book, The Billionaire and the Mechanic, how Larry Ellison and a car mechanic teamed up to win sailing's greatest race, the America's Cup, was it's been out for about a month. Its official pub date was June 4th, and we've had a great reception. Happily, it landed. It's a national bestseller, and this last weekend I noticed it was number nine on the Northern California bestseller list. And we also have an option on it for a film. So I hope you like the book because at some point you may see it as a feature film. And I'll be taking suggestions later for who should play Larry. <laughs> and uh, that will be interesting coming from here. And, uh, and who will play um, the mechanic whose name is Norbert Byron, and he's a great part of this story. Uh, he is the Commodore of the Golden Gate Yacht Club today, and he was in 2001 when this all was launched. So this is a story about, really about these two men who seem so different, the billionaire and the mechanic, and their singular quest for the America's Cup, which is the oldest trophy in international sports. And I started this story because I was really interested in the drama of going after the cup, but again, this unusual partnership between Larry and Norbert. And Norbert, uh, as I said, was the Commodore of the Golden Gate Yacht Club, which this was in 2001. The Yacht Club, uh, for those of you who may know it, it's, uh, it's down beyond, past the better known, more elite St. Francis Yacht Club. When I went there, when Norbert became Commodore, it was basically a sinking ship. It was $450,000 in debt, and he feared he had been named the Commodore who would close the doors and lower the burgee. So he was reaching out, grasping at straws, trying to find a way to save this old blue-collar boating institution on the San Francisco waterfront when he read, lo and behold, that Larry Ellison and Oracle Racing had had a falling out with the St. Francis. And he thought, well, why can't our little club be the sponsoring club of Oracle Racing? And everybody around him said, you're nuts. This is never going to happen. Why would Oracle Racing and Larry Ellison partner with this kind of unknown club, sinking in debt? Well, he didn't listen to the naysayers, and he made the deal happen along the way in about three months. I think he lost about 30 pounds, and he was working at the radiator shop by day, and he was uh, negotiating this deal at night, and he was trying to save the little Golden Gate Yacht Club and make it into the little engine that could. So. They formed this unlikely friendship and partnership that, uh, that exists today. And so this story is about the two of them, but it's also about the, many of the, the builders and the sailors and the engineers who dreamed for uh, much of their lives of being a part of a winning America's Cup team. Whether it's a Jimmy Spithill, the sailor of Oracle Racing, who dreamed from when he was a child of being a part of winning the America's Cup on the sailboat. He's an Australian, and he was uh, four years old, I believe, when Australia wrested the cup away from America in 1983 after the longest winning streak in sports. Um, and parties rang out on his beach uh, for weeks, and he thought, I'm going to be a part of this someday, and he was, or whether it's Joseph Ozan, who wanted from the time he was a child to be a part of, a, uh, of, of this thing called the America's Cup, but not to be on the boat, but to be someone who designed, who engineered the boats. And so it's, it tells, my book tells the story of the dreams, the human drama, the unlikely partnerships, the losses that led to the ultimate victory in 2010. So I'm gonna read just a couple of very quick vignettes from the book. Um, and this book starts in the Sydney to Hobart race of 1998, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. It, is, it was at the time the worst maritime disaster in Australian history. Larry Ellison, who is an accomplished sailor, he was racing on his boat Sayonara, uh, and they had just come through the eye of the hurricane, uh, which was not predicted, so they were all taken by surprise and felt that they, um, 
you know, that their lives were definitely in danger. So this is when they've come out of the eye of the hurricane. And this is an important place because, important place to start the book and to start this story, because for one thing, it, um, after Larry Ellison completed this race, he said, no more open ocean racing. I'm done with this. I'm going for around the buoys regattas. But it also, for him, reminded him of the impermanence of all things, of the fragile uh, state of life as we know it. And that is something that has stayed with him today. And this, this race was very significant, remains very significant in his life. And I'm reading this part that, uh, as a writer, I'm very proud of because I think that it's very, um, it's, uh, it's very evocative. And I love the language of it. So thanks for humoring me a little bit. On the morning of the third day, the sun was just coming up as Sayonara entered the Derwent River, an estuary leading to the capital of Tasmania. A salmon pink light cut through the mauve morning sky. The crew of Sayonara, the first to reach the Derwent, was welcomed by a small powerboat with a man on board playing Scottish Highland bagpipes, the traditional welcome for a winning boat. On this day, the songs were somber. The wind was a whisper, blowing at less than eight knots. Larry and his crew were in the river valley, and the wildflowers, fern, and towering trees carpeted deep-cut canyons with red dirt ridges. The wildflowers in shades of blue, white, crimson, purple, and heather were bathed in soft pink light. Larry closed his eyes for a moment, listening to the sounds of the bagpipe and to the waves gently lapping at the sides of the boat. The air was perfectly calm, the waves like a reassuring heartbeat. The glory of life was theirs. So that was, as I said, that was a very significant turning point, uh, surviving the Sydney to Hobart and, um, and coming out of that. So I'm going to jump around a little bit. And the next scene I'm going to read just a little bit from. And I, I want us to, I'm going to cut my talk a little bit short because I want to get to Joseph because his story is really fantastic. And you're going to see some great video. It's going to astound you of the new boats and of the boat that won the America's Cup for Oracle Racing in 2010. So I'm going to read something. And this is, when I was interviewing Larry Ellison, uh, we got to talking about his friendship with Steve Jobs and about the time that the two of them, them spent together. And he told me, gave me a lot of great um, detail on their friendship and their talks. And here is one where they are walking the grounds of Larry's then under construction Woodside Estate and talking about who was the greatest person ever. Yeah. So you can make your own guesses as to who you think they will each choose. It's kind of an interesting Rorschach test. <clears throat> so here's Larry talking. I'm talking about greatness, about taking a lever to the world and moving it, Larry said, walking the grounds of his new Woodside property with his best friend, Steve Jobs. I'm not talking about moral perfection. I'm talking about people who changed the world the most during their lifetime. Jobs, who had returned to Apple three years earlier, enjoyed the conversational volleying and placed Leonardo da Vinci and Gandhi as his top choices, with Gandhi in the lead. Leonardo, a great artist and inventor, lived in violent times and was a designer of tanks, battlements, ramparts, and an assortment of other military tools and castle fortifications. Larry joked, that had Leonardo not been gay, he would have been, quote unquote, a perfect fit for the Bush administration. Jobs, who had studied in India, cited Gandhi's doctrine of nonviolent revolution as an example of how it was possible to remain morally pure while aggressively pursuing change. Larry's choice for history's greatest person could not have been more different from Gandhi. His choice was the Corsican-born military leader, Napoleon Bonaparte. Here's Larry talking. Napoleon overthrew kings and tyrants throughout Europe, created a system of free public schools, and wrote one set of laws that applied to everybody. Napoleon achieved liberal ends through conservative means, Larry argued. Steve and Larry argued about everything including music and art. When Larry said he thought Paul Simon's lyrics for The Boxer were brilliant, Larry laughed and said, 
Steve laughed, sorry. Steve laughed and said, Larry didn't know goodness from greatness. Dylan, Jobs said, is the genius of our time. It never stopped. No one gave in, and they both enjoyed the rallying. Before Larry and Steve parted ways, Larry mentioned recent regattas he had won on Sayonara, and he talked about the America's Cup race he was readying for. Steve was interested in the materials and the innovations, whether the mylar used on the sails or the grade of carbon fiber in the hulls. Part of Larry's job, as he saw it, was to tempt and corrupt his friend with boats and planes so that he would have more fun and more time. Steve was always concerned about conspicuous consumption. He liked cars and motorcycles, but never spent a lot of money. <clears throat> what he loved was designing and redesigning things to make them more useful and more beautiful. I think this is a neat uh, little anecdote here. Larry was on the Apple board in 2000, when he had the idea that, that Apple should give Steve a 40 million Gulfstream jet so he could more efficiently take his family to Hawaii for long weekends. Immediately, Steve started designing the interior of his new plane, studying Larry's Gulfstream and making improvements on Larry's design. When he noticed that Larry had one button to open a door and another button to close it, can you imagine? Uh, Steve decided on a single toggle switch that would do both on his plane. Steve reversed the placement of the sink and the shower in the bathroom on his plane, among other changes. Larry agreed that Steve's redesigns were improvements. Larry, sure he would eventually hook his best friend on the draw of the sea, also lent Steve his, family, his boat for family vacations. Steve returned home after 10 days aboard Katana and enthused, no one bothers you on the boat. You can read and think and watch the sky change colors at, at the end of the day. Soon, Steve was showing Larry designs for his beautiful boat to be named Aqua. Well, the boat didn't end up being named Aqua. It's called Venus, and it's my belief it was recently completed and that, um, that, that Lorraine and their family is enjoying it now. But that was one thing that Larry was able to quote unquote corrupt his, his best friend about. So now we're gonna move quickly to the, back to the America's Cup. And I included the Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison scene, and there's also a scene at Steve's memorial service, which has never been reported before, because uh, the book is very much about dreamers and it's about finding innovations in whatever you do, which Joseph is gonna talk about. So the, uh, this is a very, very small vignette that I'm gonna read about America, the first boat that won the America's Cup for the United States in 1851. And it's going to be a great contrast to the boat that Joseph is gonna talk about and that I'm going to read one little uh, final vignette about. How are we doing on time? Um, so this boat was built in the 1840s uh, for around $20,000. And the boat that won the America's Cup uh, that raced basically for two races was a $40 million boat. So there have been a few advancements um, in that regard as well. So this is a little vignette about America. America, offered up as the United States' finest display of innovation on the water, was a 95-foot black gaff rig schooner with a concave bow, low freeboard, and cotton sails said to hold their shape better than the flax sails of the British yachts and shaped on the lines of a pilot boat. She had set sail from New York's East River in June and was manned throughout her Atlantic crossing by Captain W.H. Brown and a crew of 12 men. Brown had built America for $20,000 in cash. The Marquis of Anglesey, a member of the Royal Yacht Squadron, formed in 1815 and the first club in England granted the royal designation, took one look at America and said, if she is right, we are all wrong. And another Brit remarked that America looked like a quote unquote hawk among pigeons. So now we're gonna move to, um, to the final little vignette that I have. And uh, if America was a hawk among pigeons, then we'll have to come up with good descriptives for this USA 17. Larry called it his, uh, his black pterodactyl, and 
You know, it would certainly be up there with a peregrine falcon, going back to the birds. Um, so this is where Joseph's story really comes in into this book, although he had been engineering, designing boats for years before. But So this is when Oracle Racing has lost twice, 2003, 2007. Larry's been called a chump, been likened to a modern-day Sir Thomas Lipton, and he came back with what he thought would be a winning formula, and that was hire Russell Coots, the winningest skipper in America's Cup history, and build a boat the likes of which had never been seen before. So this is a pretty exciting part of, of the story. One month after the issue of the venue was decided, 50 men and two enormous cranes came together on the San Diego docks to hoist a brand new rigid wing made of carbon fiber and Kevlar and wrapped in white aeronautical film onto USA 17. The wing had grown from 150 feet to 196 feet to 206 feet and finally to an astounding 230 feet. At 23 stories, it was too tall to fit under the Golden Gate Bridge. The wing was approximately the same area as a football field, but as fragile as an egg. To better understand the power of the rigid wing, Jimmy Spithill had spent two weeks taking an intensive course in flying. He figured the best way to learn to sail this aerodynamic wonder was to get his pilot's license. So on a rare break, he returned home to Australia, visited a small country airfield, and explained to the guys what he wanted to do. His flight instructor, also a sailor, took him out every day for hours at a time in weather that grounded other planes. Jimmy was immediately struck by the similarities between flying and sailing. A well-set-up plane, one driven smoothly, was easy to fly and had less drag. In the same way, a properly balanced boat was easy a properly balanced boat, trimmed well, was easy to sail. The experience hooked him on flying. When Jimmy stepped aboard USA 17, which they called the Beast, he briefly looked up. It was as if someone had ripped the wing off of a jetliner and placed it on his boat. The plan for the day had been to go out and take it slow and easy so the crew could gradually begin to get a feel for the huge wing-sailed boat. But the boat wanted to fly, and once Dirk de Ritter started to trust the data, Jimmy felt like a jockey trying to hold back his horse. He asked Scott Ferguson, a designer on board, whether he could fly a hull and accelerate USA 17 to a much higher speed. Now is a good, as a good a time as any, Ferguson said, holding his breath. As the boat outperformed anyone's expectations, Ferguson had tears in his eyes. Joseph Ozan and Mike Drummond watched in awe as their experimental side project became the main event. Larry had been told to get to San Diego as soon as possible so he could see the wing sail. As he approached Lindbergh Field near the San Diego Harbor, he, he banked his CJ-4 twin jet over the harbor and looked down. That's when he saw the winged trimaran for the first time. Seeing the boat from the air, he thought to himself, Oh my God, what have we done? This is madness. When USA 17 returned to the docks, the entire team of engineers, builders, and sailors were there. They still had a regatta to win in Valencia, but they had already pulled off one of the biggest engineering victories in maritime history. So Joseph, is a very interesting guy, and you're gonna love seeing the video and hearing him talk and asking us questions after, but he was 29 when he joined Oracle Racing in 2004, and he was told uh, after the 2007 loss to go off and investigate this rigid wing and see if this can be done. And Mostly it was this, what you called a utopian idea, right? That it was kind of fantastical. And he had graduated from a very prestigious university, Super Aero in France, which was dedicated to aerospace. And, um, and there's a funny story about uh, when I was talking with him that he told me about um, how his professors used to rib him about, why are you at an aerospace school when you're interested in studying boat design? 
And um, so why was that? What was it for you that was so interesting about boats? First, because there is no other option, you know, because finding a good school for, for, for learning boat design is not easy. And okay. also because now, I mean, it's the same. It's a, I mean, a boat is a, such a complex machine that uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's the same physics uh, uh, behind that. And you've got wings on a sailboat, except that the wing, instead of being horizontal, it's being vertical. And now you've got even... It's aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, so it's the same concept behind that. So it's a great way to learn. Uh, I mean, aircraft have been designed for years and years, and, uh, and, and they are just very nice machine now. And, and as a boat designer, you try to use what's, what's done on this field and to apply all the techniques of aeronautics in the boat design is just like amazing because we can do great things, and we have like now the machine, I mean the machine you're gonna see on the video uh, are just amazing, and it's just like little aircraft, and uh, so it literally fly above the water. So the, the wing, the, the wing sail that reached 230 feet, uh, the largest wing ever built for air or for sea was largely, uh, there were other people working on it, but Joseph, again, took it from this utopian vision to a reality that, um, you know, that, that boat, the likes of which will not see, be seen again. But so now how does what you learn there apply to what we're going to see? Because we're going to see this video clip a little bit. You'll see the end of 2010. You'll see USA 17, the trimaran, and then you'll see these new boats. Yeah, so basically, I mean, uh, when, we, when we design a boat, I mean, the way we work and when we race, especially America's Cup, the only thing that matters for us, it's being fast on the water. So whatever we do, we just do it for... Uh, being faster and faster. So the speed is really the only criteria we're looking at. And at the end, uh, so when we saw, um, when we designed USA 17, there was no uh, rigid wing initially, and we just looked for solution to go even faster on the water. And, um, and uh, the rigid wing was a solution uh, uh, that was, it, it maybe was kind of obvious, but, uh, it was just such a project and such a scale that was a bit uh, an unknown in terms of uh, was it feasible, was it manageable, and uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, we 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 design and build this wing, and it's just like it was a success. I mean, uh, thanks to that, the America's Cup is uh, we won the America's Cup, and the America's Cup is here in San Francisco now. So it's just like. Nice story for that. It yeah. is a nice story, yeah. but also an interesting story because it brings together the the part of the various parts of an America's Cup team: the engineers, the builders, and the sailors. And Joseph and his his um, his peers had to work with the sailors to kind of help them understand this new way of sailing that was very data driven. And can you talk yeah, a little bit about what's that? What's fascinating is, uh, so we have obviously some a sailing team, which is, I mean, an, an amazing sailing team. So we work with the best sailor in the world. And uh, it's just for, as an amateur sailor, it's always very impressive to have this guy around you. I mean, it's just like you work with the best guy in the, in, in, in this, uh, in the sport. So, um, but so initially, I mean, we are seen like engineers. So we are computer guys, and just uh, we, on the paper, we can't really interact with them. So we spend a lot of time uh, talking to them and uh, exchanging um, ideas and, and, and we have discussion about what's happening on the water, what's happening on the computer. And what's really interesting is, um, so they kind of like the idea of having a wing, but uh, obviously they had no idea how to use it. So, um, so for us, I mean, I mean, our job is to model the the, the wing and model the boat, so we know how to 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 trim it, uh, what's the best settings, and uh, and uh, it was kind of um, it's it's kind of uh, of weird for them to to have a new tool like that, and uh, so um, so when I mean you have to tell them uh, how to use it. So you ended up in a situation where you give advice uh, how to sail a boat to the best guy in, in the world, you know? So they've been doing this job for years and years, and, and you ended up like, you no, know, you should trim your boat or your wing that way, and said, I mean, initial reaction could have been, hey, who are you to tell me that? But then, I mean, little by little, you build kind of a relationship and a trust. Uh, um, between the sailors and the designers, and you end up doing great things. So, at the end, it's really an interaction with uh, with um, 
with two different worlds. And uh, that's great about America's Cup is to see this technology being this, this bridge between the two worlds. Mm -hmm. you know? Do you want to show I the... I think we could, yeah, we, at least we have an idea of what okay. we're talking about. Yeah. So I'm going to go. So obviously the rigid wing is part of uh, this technology now and it's uh, a pretty uh, well-known technology and we make a lot of progress on that. And uh, also now the boats are flying above the water. So you I mean, you saw in the video that you don't have any more hull uh, immersed. So it's really a brand new world, brand new hair for sailing. And, uh, and it's where for us as a designer, it's just like a super exciting challenge. And, uh, and because we, I mean, we have new, I mean, we bring sailing in a new dimension, so we need to work with the third dimension. Now we can lift the boat above the water, and we have like uh, problems to solve, like exactly like in flight mechanics. So we need to work on stability to be able to maintain the flight and how you can drive these things. And uh, so it's really, really the focus is. I mean, we didn't want, uh, uh, we didn't look for, uh, um, f we didn't look for flying at, at any price. You know, just went there because it was the fastest solution so we just like with our approach we just try to design the boat and and we look for solutions and you ended up with this kind of machine and um, and I think it's a really machine it's really a sailing machine we can go two or three times uh, the wind speed so whatever is the wind we can double or triple the speed of the wind just without any engine so it's, uh, it's just like uh, you ended up with an incredible uh, uh, piece of technology and this is I think the fascinating part of uh, of our job is to be able to understand how this very complex system works. So um, it's really um, a machine that works in, in between two. I mean, you've got the hair and you've got the water. And so it's, I think, uh, to my mind, it's a bit more complex than even an aircraft because aircraft, you only have hair around and it's just like always uh, uh, symmetrical, not always sailing in the same direction. Where on a sailboat, you need to have the interaction between what's happening in the air and what's happening in the water. And whatever you do, one part is affecting the other one. So it's like whatever um, uh, rudder angle you give or whatever change of direction you have, it's going to affect your the, the flow above as well. It's going to affect the engine. So at the end, I mean, what I call the engine, it's going to affect the wing. So at the end, it's really a complex uh, equation to solve. And what's fascinating, and, and I think with, uh, it's, it's also fascinating to work with the sailors for that purpose, is because you have to, we, we give them a machine, but they have to understand how to use it. So it's really uh, understanding this, uh, this, uh, this equation, is, it's, it's very complex and, uh, and, and very exciting, because then when you see this kind of, of picture and this kind of speed, I think it's quite a success and quite a, it's quite a good thing for the sport as well. So um, well, now you have a, a wing in the air, and then you have the winglets it, underneath. So you've got these wings above and wings below exactly. that that's you're designing, it's, which is it's, very cool. Looking. That's why you can learn from aircraft, you know, because yeah. uh, basically we have a wing, a vertical to propel the boat, and we also now we reach some speeds that we can lift the boat exactly <laughs> like an, a normal wing. You lift the boat in the water, so we've got hydrofoils. And uh, the boat, roughly the one you saw, are roughly seven tons, uh, uh, the platform plus the wing plus the crew. So you can lift uh, really your boat um, with the speed we're reaching. You can really lift the boat above the water. So you ended up creating a seven ton force to lift the weight of the boat from this uh, little horizontal wing that are, be that are below the water. So with maybe one or two square meter of, of, of carbon, you can just... Uh, literally fly above the water and you ended up reaching speed of 40, 45 knots, which is roughly 50 miles an hour. So it's really, I mean, especially in San Francisco, when you, when you ride, I mean, you sail along the Golden Gate Bridge. I think the limit on the Golden Gate Bridge is 45 miles an hour. So you just go faster than the car. So it's just like, <laughs> so it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting and it's quite fascinating for that purpose. And, uh, yeah. So is this better than you imagined? Or is it like when you were thinking about I could be a part of this design team or engineering team, or how far the design and the sport has gone. I mean, I think this, uh, the sky is a limit. Normally, you can go. I mean, we can. The sky is a limit, yeah. yeah, the thing is, basically, you you try always. I mean, we do everything we can to go faster. And what's interesting here is, 
inside the America's Cup, you still have a rule to follow. So there is like a, we've got a like 30 pages document that gives a rule. So everybody has more or less the same boat. So this is, I mean, as an engineer, it's very interesting because you need to be the fastest possible inside this rule. But um, so this is why we don't, again, we don't, we didn't start it from scratch. So we just have a basic set of rule and our work is to go as fast as possible. Again, that's pretty basic, but the only thing we try to do is just to go faster. <laughs> so, so, so that's why, I mean, the, the, we, I mean, we are really at the beginning of a new era in sailing. So we can really, I'm pretty sure we can improve and I'm pretty sure we can, we can have uh, even a better design, better technology. And uh, I mean, this summer is gonna be great because we're gonna have several teams. They work individually on this design, so we can have competition. We, we, you saw, we have two boats here, so we have already some internal competition just to get uh, up to speed. But uh, we, I mean, every day we go sailing, we just learn new stuff and, uh, and it's a new dimension for that. So I think it's, it's great for the sport. And uh, it's gonna be awesome. In September, we're going to see what's happening. Oh, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how yeah. your designs do, right? Exactly. Uh, so I know we wanted to open it, have some time to open it up for questions. Um, so who has questions for either of us? The original class rules didn't anticipate foiling, and obviously the Kiwis figured that out, and now everyone's followed. Could you elaborate a little bit on how, is that just because they, you're able to get more lift than was anticipated, or how, can you talk a little bit about how the transition to foiling happened? Uh, I think the, um, it's, um, I mean, it's a natural uh, development in the sense that, again, what we try to do is to reduce drag. So basically, the, our main uh, job is to reduce the drag as much as possible. And what's happening is, one big source of drag is the hull itself. So traditionally, I mean, foiling is not new in, in the sailing world, and uh, you know, I've been foilers before, and so it's a natural thing to try to lift the boat. And initially in the rule, um, uh, the people that wrote the rule, they tried to avoid that because it's kind of, I mean, a bit dangerous, and uh, I mean, it's a bit tricky to manage, but they tried to do that, but I mean, figure out a way to, to, um, to, do, to do that anyway. And um, so the, the, the Kiwi were the first one to release picture of their foiling. I mean, we, we've been sailing on our uh, smaller catamarans and we've been flying as well. So it's just like a, we, we did a lot of experiment on the, the 45 footer, which is a smaller scale of this boat. And uh, so it's just a natural uh, uh, development. And because you try to reduce drag, you end up foiling and you figure out the solution to be able to foil and to fly inside the rule. So it's kind of, um, whenever we do fast multi uh you end up in this, I, I'm pretty sure we're gonna end up in this, uh, in this kind of situation. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna see more and more boats like that because it's just like, um, it's faster, so. Um, you mentioned the constraints that are introduced by the rules of the, the race. Yep. Um, and uh, also, um, I mean, I'm not a big expert on America's Cup, but like noticing a lot of people running around the boat. Um, obviously, you know, sailing is a team sport and all of that. But let's say that you had absolute freedom to remove all of those constraints. And, and if that, are there chances that, that that will change, the constraints will change over time uh, based on the new designs and so on. And the second one, are, are those people really still needed? Uh, can you like replace them with? Uh, um, yeah, or is it just because, like, because so, of the tradition? So to answer the first part of the question, um, uh, once I mean this, that's that's interesting in the America's Cup is we are still racing, so we have a race course, and so we need to go upwind, we need to go downwind, so we need we we need to to have a proper race. So there is a lot of compromise. So you can tune a boat for going upwind, you can tune your boat for downwind, and it's. Very interesting because you you have to trade off the different uh, operating conditions, and depending on what you do, you you can end up with different design. For example, our two boats they are slightly different in terms of tuning. So one is better upwind, one is better downwind. So we need to figure out which 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 one is I mean which one is the best, what's the best solution. So we don't do a boat for speed record. You know, if you have to do a boat for speed record and they can go faster, the speed record right now is like 65 knots, something like that but it's a machine that couldn't, it's impossible to sail in the bay. So 
we really have an envelope, and I think America's Cup is still about, uh, it's still a, it's still a race. So you're gonna you're gonna have mark rounding, and you have a starting line, a finishing line, and you have to up win and down win. So it's still inside the rule. So I don't think this envelope will disappear. And um, the second part of your question was more about um, simulation, right? I mean, um, uh, well, like people, people yeah, the people. The yeah, people. exactly. So what's interesting here is uh, for us, I mean. We struggle to model uh, how to um, how to drive a boat. So if you give a I mean, if you give to a computer the power to drive the boat, uh, it's not that easy to, to to do. And the guys, they are like just incredible. Uh, they feel the wind, how to react, anticipate, and everything. And we are still at a level where we are. I don't think we are really able to to capture the le the, the skills of the sailors for that. So um, we still need them to go fast, and they are extremely good for that. So when we give them a machine, they are able to say, "Okay, that's what we can do with that." We can. So, that, so that's, that's the envelope of, of performance. And um, so you still want uh, people on board first because it's a sport. So you want like uh, um, you want people involved, but also because it's still the fastest solution. So what's happening is a. Uh, it's it's interesting because in my uh, I, I mean uh, few times I met uh, like I met people from Formula One industry or from um, uh, the aeronautic world and I've been asking more or less the same question is how do you model uh, the human behavior to make sure that we can understand exactly what's happening and um, and. <coughs> In Formula One, you have a lot of uh, money involved and a lot of people, and even more in aeronautics, where you go in Airbus or Boeing, and even these guys, they still give simulators to the pilot just to make sure that they can collect the proper information, which is a proof that you still need somebody uh, to drive the machine and to drive it faster. <laughs> So I, I get that part, like you still need the skipper, and, and yep. but like the people that are just running around pulling winches and just basically are being used as a weight, um, so are, are those uh, tradition? Um, no, it's yeah, it, it's yeah, it's it's probably a tradition in the sense that we we don't uh, we don't uh, it's the, the only source of energy is uh, it need to be human, so we don't have any engine any. So we use hydraulics for, I mean, to under the loads, but the pump, hydraulic pumps are driven by the sailors. So can can you reduce the number of people significantly? Uh, it's it's um, I mean, without the human power, it's gonna be hard to trim the boat. So you need this because you need like a certain amount of energy to under the loads. So on these boats, we, there are eleven on board, and it's. I mean, they would be happy with more people. It's so, such hard work that uh, you, you, need, you need these guys. So without any external source of energy, you will need these people. So you need all 11 to, to work this boat. If you put more, it's going to be an overkill. If you put less, it's basically going to be... I so mean, it's, it's an optimized solution. Exactly, because yes. if you put less, I mean, you will have less people to be able to trim the boat, so you're probably going to be slower. If you put more, you add weight, which is uh, 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 you try to be as light as possible. So yes, you need, I mean, at the end, it's a good compromise. But uh, that, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's still a sailboat, so you need like only use human power and the wind just to go. So. Um, is there an optimal amount for the boat to heal? I noticed in the video that sometimes the upwind hydroflow is in the water, but yeah. not always. Do you want it in there for the control surface or out for less drag? Can you talk about those kinds of issues? Yeah, so what's happening is, um, so the boat is, um, I mean, the boat is a very, uh, it's what I was mentioning earlier, it's a very complex machine, so you need to find the proper balance between what's happening above the water and what's happening below the water. And obviously when you go against the wind, when you go upwind, um, it's uh, intuitively, it's, it's, it's harder, to, I mean, you go a bit slower because you are going against the wind. And um, so you are, um, the speed you are reaching us are slower. I mean, even if upwind, we still go 20, 25 knots upwind, so against the wind. And um, so overall, you go slower, so you're gonna need to, I mean, it's harder to generate uh, the lift to lift the boat above the water. So you've got a trade-off between 
the amount of, I mean, you need to, when you create a force, it's going to create drag. So if you need to create the seven tons on the foil upwind, it's possible, but it can obviously create some drag. And then you're going to lift your hull, and you're going to reduce the drag of the hull. So it's a trade-off between how much you reduce the hydro drag and how much drag you, inc you, you add by creating this force on the foil. So roughly, I mean, what right now with these boats, when you go upwind, you still have the, the, early, the leeward hull is still immersed. And when you go downwind, we're able to fly. I mean, with winds of um, below 10 knots, we, already have, we, we can already uh, be foiling. So it's, yeah, so it's quite, it's quite, I mean, it's all a matter of compromises, the trade-off between the upwind and downwind and the conditions. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, the bay is notorious for its conditions in terms yes. of wind changes and so forth. So I'm just wondering how much you that went, went into your design. And then a completely different question, you talked about racing. Over time, stuff developed in racing cars has come down to ordinary, you know, independent suspension, various things like this. When can I expect a wing sail on my 35-foot <laughs> uh, keelboat? I will be very happy uh, to put one on your boat if you want. Uh, I... <laughs> Well, I, I mean, honestly, I, especially for uh, uh, the sailing community, I think it's much simpler to handle. So it's easier to sail, easier to understand. You can maneuver your boat uh, uh, with more efficiency. So, I mean, obviously, logistically, it's a bit complex. So if you can solve the logistical issue, I'm pretty sure that it's, it, it can. I mean, we see more and more. We're rigid wings, and the good thing about the America's Cup, it's a good, uh, it's um, good publicity for these wings, and probably in the future you, uh, you can you can see that. And I will, I mean, I will even uh, even be happy to put wings on the on like on a cargo ship or something like that, just to save uh, to save uh, uh, gas, you know. So it's just like a kind of solution which is quite reliable. And and regarding your, your other question about the condition in the bay. I mean, we spend a lot of time uh, studying the condition, the current. Um, the, we have historical data about um, uh, the previous years. And if somebody can tell me what's going to be the weather on 7th of September, <laughs> I mean, that takes the information straight away, you know? <laughs> because we can obviously tune our boat, so it's a bit of an unknown. But I would love to know the weather in September for the race. Um, <clears throat> so my question is about the, uh, the technology has advances, and obviously it's great to see all the engineering going in, the, in those boats, but I feel like it, uh, it makes it harder for competitors to catch up, and more expensive as well. Uh, in particular, we went from uh, 12 or so challengers to three this year. Uh, so what... Uh, maybe what, you what, should, maybe you should answer, you know, the, you know more than... Yeah. So I, what, 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 what do you see the future yeah. of the America's Cup? I think there will be a scaling back of the size of the boats. That's what Russell Coots has said to me. Um, but I think that the going from 12 contenders to three largely was a result of the economy at the time and the uh, mortgage crisis that spread from that spread abroad and really caused uh, global problems, especially in Europe, and caused a number of the teams that were in Europe to pull out of the race. Um, so I think the objective, from what I've heard from the, the, the key players, including Larry Ellison, is to make this more accessible. I mean, it's never been a race that has been uh, accessible to all. It's all it, the history of the America's Cup is that you, you really need uh, a fat wallet. And um, so I don't think that's going to change, but I think the boats will be scaled down a bit in size. That's what I've been told. Um, they, they, interestingly enough, so Russell Coote said to me that they, they had the AC-45s, which they use for the World Series regattas, but they were looking at a boat. They needed a boat that would look big enough uh, and imposing enough and enough like an America's Cup boat on television, where you would see it and say, this is definitely an America's Cup boat. And so they went to the 72s. But they found out in retrospect that the AC-45s were also really fantastic looking uh, for the mass media market. So I think that um, there will be um, a bit of a 
a bit of a scaling down. What have you heard uh, about that? Also, about the boats? obviously, you've got less competitors, but uh, what we need to keep in mind is the level of the competition is very high. So, I mean, it's still America's Cup, and it's not, it's not easy to win. So we need to keep that because if uh, it's still a, a tough challenge. And uh, right now, with less, I mean, even if we have less team, the level of of, of, uh, of racing is incredibly high. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a tough win for sure. So Which this is, is yeah. one of the goal of the America's Cup, and it's for sure this is uh, it's gonna be the case. Yeah, yeah Jimmy Spithill told me that um, you know in the past America's Cup you've had a dozen contenders, but only three or four really viable competitors. And so now you don't have that dozen, but you have the really tough, viable competitors that, that you're going up against. I've, I've, I mean, I've been involved in the um, a campaign with Oracle in 2007, and uh, we had this group of, we call that the big, uh, the big, uh, big four. So even if there are 12 competitors, we still have the big four, which is really the tough competitors. So you knew before that these guys will be in semifinals. So at the end, Maybe we, we, we went straight to the big four, but it's just like, a, obviously there is some, some background that uh, Julian described, so. So I, I have a comment and a couple questions. <laughs> One of the comment is, do you think that the, or I guess it's a question, do you think that the, the viable competitors, is it, a, is it a, um, a, a sport competition type competitiveness or is it a financial competition? It's so multifaceted. So you have to have the engineering and the designing side and then you have to have the material part of it, the, the builders who know where to get the best grade of carbon fiber. Um, so it's all of those components that you, that you absolutely have to have, which makes it so complex and also so um, intellectually stimulating for those involved. I mean, having that, I mean, having all that money around America's Cup, it helps to develop this kind of technology, and we're gonna see this technology in the future, and it's gonna be, so it helps improving the sport as well. So, it's expensive, but in comparison with the sport, it's not that expensive. How do you keep the the boat from flying completely out of the water and losing control? We need to find a subtle balance between, uh, I mean, a boat uh, is basically an unstable machine, so it can capsize, it can so. We need to bring some stability, and uh, so we can, uh, by playing with the shape of the foils, we can bring some stability. So when when you when the boat is flying, you can maintain a stable flight. And um, but this uh, this kind of uh, foils or this kind of shapes uh, so, uh, often uh, is uh, is draggy. So it just kind of uh, uh, create too much drag. So it's it's okay, it's flying, but it's not that fast. So we need to find a, um, where to put the cursor between the performance, so the speed, and the stability. So the sailors should be comfortable at, at flying the boat and, and still be fast. So it's part of, um, of our, our, um, our research and development is where to find this, uh, this balance. And um, so overall, we ended up with a situation where we've got a pretty unstable machine. And, uh, and, there, and we've got some input from the crew to maintain the flight. So for example, in our case, we can, so we've got this horizontal uh, wing, uh, hydrofoil, so with an uh, uh, horizontal surface uh, that are immersed, and we can change the angle of attack depending on the altitude. So um, basically the crew is playing with this, uh, this angle, so we can manually adjust the flight uh, uh, from the crew. And uh, so it's it's uh, it's we need to find the correct balance between stability and performance, and it is like part of our day-to-day -day job. Uh, final question: um, Can I get a ride? Uh, <laughs> it's, not it's, my fun. Code. it's fun. It's <laughs> fun. Yeah. It's something else. I was yeah. on one of the AC45s and had a quite a ride. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's great. You can come and see the races. You're going to be races tomorrow. Yeah, the racing, two, the two-boat race, racing one, starts yeah. tomorrow. So yeah. check it out. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, when you went to the fixed wing, that there was sort of a negotiation period with sailors because they were not used to flying that. So what were the ways, the most significant ways in which you had to overcome a sailor's natural uh, inclinations? That I mean, basically, what's... Are the significant differences between flying a standard sail and a, and a fixed it's, wing? It's still a sailboat, so it's but it's it's doing the same. So you try to propel your boat, so it's 
just doing the same thing, except that the tool you're using to create uh, the trust is different. So we just need to make sure that uh, the sailors understand that they still, uh, they still try to create some trust, and, uh, and, uh, and it's, still, it's like a normal sail plan, except that the tool you're using is different, so the way you create this force is different. So the only thing is to teach them what are the settings uh, that, uh, that will be okay to recreate what was happening before. And then, so initially it was a bit, uh, it was a bit uh, um, complex for them because you, you, are, um, you, you rely more, more on numbers and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and data and everything. Where, uh, I mean, I remember uh, um, during the 2010 campaign where we had this, uh, one of the quotes that you're going to find in the book is, uh, normally a sailor look at his sail, you know, and check how, it fly, how it, it, it's, in the, it's in the air. And when you go in an aircraft, the pilot doesn't look at his wing, you know, so it's just like, I just need to get used to that. But overall, at the end, the sailor still have used his, his feeling and this, how the boat is loaded and how, how the boat reacts. So now they are at a level where they can use it properly. Mm -hmm.